Uh, all right, so we have about 20 minutes. I think most people in this room probably know who you are, but just in case okay. they don't, will you just introduce yourself first? Sure. Uh, I'm Gil Verdon, founder of Extropic, also known as, uh, or formerly known, as Beth Jezos uh, online. Um, and I was the founder of a movement called uh, EAC, which was for, amongst other things, the decentralization of, of AI and uh, AI sovereignty. Uh, so uh, it's crazy to see how much uh, the movement has mutated and evolved, and now there's whole institutes dedicated to exploring these ideas. There's whole companies now. Uh, there's a whole community uh, being built around these principles. Uh, and it's really beautiful to see a sort of idea propagate and flourish. And so, you know, first of all, I just want to give a round of applause for everyone being here and, and growing the community for decentralized AI. So. Okay. Okay, that's, that's great. And then you didn't really say your background. Can we just do 30 seconds on that in terms of how you got here <laughs> during your life? Yeah, I guess uh, I was a theoretical physicist trying to understand uh, theories of everything about the universe and uh, worked on quantum cosmology and black holes. And that got me eventually into how to bring AI to quantum computers to take inspiration from nature. Uh, did some of the early works on AI on quantum computers, uh, some of the first algorithms. Ended up getting poached straight out of school by uh, Google and built a product known as TensorFlow Quantum uh, with uh, Trevor, who's in the back there, uh, who's now my co-founder and CTO. Um, over the years, we realized that there could be non-anthropocentric forms of intelligence, so not human-like intelligence, but just generalizing intelligence to take inspiration from physics. Um, and that journey brought me to other types of physics, such as stochastic thermodynamics, which is the physics of jiggly stuff, the physics of biology and matter. And uh, I wanted to go beyond uh, quantum intelligence and try to take um, inspiration from physics in a new, a new way and uh, pioneered a new paradigm of computing called thermodynamic computing, which is what we're pursuing currently. And we'll discuss today. Yeah, yeah. Let, well, let's dive into that. So maybe give an overview of what Extropic does today in thermodynamic computing. <laughs> an overview. Um, I mean, there's a lot. So we're reinventing fundamentally new primitives at the hardware layer. Um, and we're figuring out the most efficient way to embed AI algorithms into the physics of electrons and hardware. Um, so that's a full stack effort from literally the physics of electrons below the level of a single transistor, uh, all the way up to algorithms and applications and compilers. And so it's arguably the most ambitious computing project of all time since computing itself, uh, <laughs> which is you know uh, ambitious, but we are in Silicon Valley. You got, you got to do the hard things if they're worth it. Um, and we've been making a lot of progress. We've had a mix of. Um, having a lot of publicity and then going quiet for a bit, as any deep tech startup should, uh, in bursts. And uh, we have uh, quite a burst of announcements in the coming months, uh, some of them in the coming weeks. And so it's going to be very exciting. But um, yeah, essentially, we're chasing uh, an acceleration and a much great, in terms of time and a much greater energy efficiency for AI at large, but more generally for any probabilistic algorithm, any sort of Monte Carlo algorithm, simulations of nature, biology, financial markets, robotics, optimization. Uh, so it, it, it's really a paradigm of computing, not just another AI accelerator, not just another von Neumann architecture with slightly different memory. Uh, it's a whole new beast. Um, yeah. I, I really want the audience to understand like what it is. Like w how would you explain it in just one sentence of like what why it's so different and how you're using heat to really do this. Yeah, so, you know, Einstein won a Nobel Prize for Brownian motion, which is uh, just when you drop a particle uh, in a bunch of water, it's jiggling about, and uh, that's just the random motion of it. If you add a, a drift term, so if it's moving consistently on average in a certain direction, uh, and you, you can control the noise, it's called diffusion. So you're probably familiar with diffusion models, um, essentially, we create devices that have controllable diffusion of populations of electrons. Mm -hmm. And we embed a bunch of algorithms, modern Gen AI algorithms, 
old school Monte Carlo algorithms into that physics. So we're creating devices with programmable stochastic electron physics. Does so that make sense to people? <laughs> okay, great. Well, generative AI is literally just shaping a blob, a probability distribution, to mimic a certain target distribution. And so if you have parameterized stochastic physics, you can, you can tune the parameters until the output blob matches your target blob. And there you go, you just did machine learning as physics. Uh, it's, pretty, it's, it's as simple as that, but of course, to create a device where the con you know the, the, you have very precise controls of, of these dynamics yeah. is, is the challenge. And you know, that, that's the world we came from. In quantum computing, you have programmable quantum dynamics, yeah. right? which is much harder uh, to set up than, than stochastic dynamics. Um, in a sense, we don't have a choice but to go stochastic. Uh, we're kind of at the end of the road in terms of classical or deterministic hardware. Um, because as you try to make transistors smaller and try to, make, try to use less power, you end up in the regime where these, these thermodynamic fluctuations screw up your classical deterministic computations and your, your computer crashes. And so we're ensuring sort of an extension to Moore's law in many ways. And um, if, if you look at the origins of, of, of alternative computing, Richard Feynman proposed quantum computing, but he also looked into the thermodynamics of, of computing itself. And, uh, he had a saying, there's plenty of room at the bottom. So there's actually, people don't understand how much more efficient compute can be. And we are a proof of concept, of that concept. Our brain runs on 20 watts, and there's still no supercomputer on Earth that can emulate our brains or have a model that can rival it in terms of its uh, amount of compute for AI. Mm -hmm. And so there's a way to take inspiration from the physics underlying biology, which is stochastic thermodynamics. And, uh, and, and create a device that's as efficient, if not more efficient, than the brain. That's what okay. we're doing. Yeah, and then uh, this is the question I just texted you before we got up here, but I want to better understand if they're pre-programmed to support specific distributions, or are they more generic? Does that make sense? Yeah, so what we're going to announce soon is that we have several primitives that uh, are building blocks that you could put together into a more general Okay. A distribution, right? Okay. Just like any anything, you want it to be a modular system, and uh, you know, engineering new fundamental primitives at the hardware layer is is a challenge in itself, and we've made quite a bit of progress there. But then, connecting the dots of how would you program them, how would you integrate them into a modern workflow, we've also had some breakthroughs internally, and we're looking forward to open sourcing uh, these breakthroughs and open sourcing the software so that. Uh, we can, everybody can collaborate in a decentralized fashion in helping the advent of this paradigm of computing. We're going to need everyone to help us sort of explore the combinatorial space of things you can do with this new type of computing in the, in the coming years and month. And, um, you know, we're going to put, be putting out some tooling out there and some dev kits uh, for people to try out. Yeah. Well, let, let's stay on that. So as you kind of said, you have been quiet for a while. And like, what, what can you share on what is coming out? You kind of alluded to some of it, but what else can you say about that? Yeah. Um, I mean, so uh, probably in a week or two, there's going to be some announcements uh, about us jumping from a cryo-cooled superconducting substrate like some may have seen. There was, a, there was a, a film we put out there of our lab in Canada where we did our very first thermodynamic computing experiments for us is very natural coming from quantum computing to start in superconductors, because that's what we were familiar with, and we knew we could have the right programmable electron diffusion physics. We're going to put out uh, the scientific paper on that uh, in the coming month or two. Uh, it's just at the polishing stage. On the more exciting front, you know, products propagate in the market if they have high replicator fitness, and if you can't manufacture something at scale, your product doesn't really matter, mm -hmm. right? So you can have a chip in the lab that's cryo-cooled that's more efficient than the brain. That's great. doesn't matter that much. Can you put it in every device on Earth, including maybe your brain and whatnot? Um, well, then you need to go with mass-scale manufacturable processes. You need to go with TSMC, Intel, Global Foundry, Samsung, one of these big fabs, and figure out how to use their processes to do your new form of computing. And so we figured out how to do that, figured out how to do that over the past year. Um, and I have a little something here. Um, oh, wow, a live demo. <laughs> it's not a demo. 
But this is the first uh, silicon room temperature thermodynamic computer. Um, check it out in Wired in about a week or two. Uh, we have some announcements on what's on this chip and what it means. Um, but eventually, these types of chips are going to be in everything. And we really believe that. Um, if you scale up this type of chip, uh, currently, for certain generative AI benchmarks, it's about 10,000 times more energy efficient than a GPU. So that's highly non-trivial. And this is not something that needs to be cryo-cooled. It's something that you can put in every device that runs at room temperature. Uh, and we're going to scale these up very quickly. And so uh, stay tuned. And uh, hopefully, as we announce dev kits and open source software, down download the software, try it out, uh, and contribute to the advent of thermodynamic intelligence with us. OK, can I, can I hold it? <laughs> sure. There you go. Fantastic. <laughs> Amazing. All right, so they're, they're already telling me that I have five minutes left, which is very stressful because I've gotten <laughs> through one of 10 questions. Yeah, we should talk about EAC. Or yeah, yeah, OK, OK. So yeah. let's go. Why do you think that it's so important to decentralize AI? And where does so, it fit into everything we've been talking about? So I wrote the EAC manifesto after doing the initial calculations for Extropic. And it was very humbling to me that we could create artificial intelligence that's far more energy efficient than the brain. And um, it was a sort of ego death. And I had to understand what our place in the universe was and how everything fits together. And um, I started viewing uh, everything from you know, biology to how our compute works to free markets through the lens of stochastic thermodynamics or thermodynamic selection. Um, essentially, if you look at the equations of at equilibrium thermodynamics, every bit of information that specify specifies how to configure matter is being selected for according to its ability to confer its host an advantage for growth. And so technologies, memes, cultures, genes, just about everything is constantly competing, forking from one another, and being selected, and that is a sort of optimization algorithm or an intelligence algorithm that is a non-human intelligence. Uh, and it really, it just made me realize that intelligence is everywhere from our biology, right? There's Michael Levin, Carl Friston, or famous thinkers in this space, to free markets are a form of AI, in, in my view. And that made me realize that, you know, in order for AI research to make consistent progress, you would need a decentralized effort and decentralized competition so that we don't end up in local minima or local optima of ways to do things. And we've seen this, and you know, I've, I've been uh, very loud online uh, uh, you know, with this opinion that we shouldn't have only a few centralized labs having the oligopoly or monopoly over AI research because there's a lot of risks in over-concentrating a hyperparameter space. There could be a whole new way of doing things that's very disruptive. So we've seen this with DeepSeq with software. We're doing it with hardware. Everybody's doing half a trillion dollar build outs uh, on GPUs, and we're going to put a dent in that with this. That's our goal. Uh, and so I think, you know, in times of uncertainty and, and dynamism, you want to maintain variance. Uh, you don't want to over concentrate uh, in, in any sort of parameter space, whether it's culture, whether it's design, whether it's art. Uh, whether it's governance schemes, whether it's technology, whether it's um, heuristics of how to train your, your systems. And so uh, that's why I've just been uh, for free markets of ideas, free markets of compute, and for, for freedom of AI research, and for everyone to be able to own their own models, be able to tinker with them, and own their own compute. I think that's a really important component to, for individuals to maintain their sovereignty, for companies to maintain their sovereignty, in this era of AI, if we only have big centralized compute and big centralized AI labs, we're all deferring part of our intelligence to this one model. We become a Borg-like mind. There's a sort of mode collapse in terms of ways we can think. Right? We've seen this with some models having certain cultural priors that were hard-coded that you know, were kind of forceful. Um, I, think, I think the future is everyone 
owning their own compute, owning the own, their own extension of their, their cognition. But in order to have that model of decentralized AI be competitive, you needed a, a densification of compute. And you needed compute to be spatially denser, to take up far less energy, to have more thoughts per watt, if you will. And I wanted to solve that in order to avoid the future where we become one big, uh, governed by one big centralized world government AGI. Uh, and so, you know, I'm so glad that there's a community tackling the software uh, and the philosophy now uh, so that I could focus on, on the hardest part, uh, which is the hardware layer. Um, yeah. Maybe speak to how this relates to EAC, because you mentioned it before. It's come a long way. I bet a lot of people in the audience are members of this movement. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it kind of was a coincidence. Again, both EAC came to me as like a vision of how the world works. And really, it's like if, if everything, including culture, is being selected for growth, if you have a pro-growth culture, right? And, and it's not just growth of like a subsystem. It's growth of the whole system of civilization then if you have a constantly adaptive culture, that's really a meta culture. It's not one prescription. It's a, a meta prescription. It's maintaining variance even across cultures and always adapting, always being dynamic. That culture asymptotically would win in the mimetic competition. And so that's the culture I wanted to spread. And clearly due to its mimetic spread and success, by construction, it was, it was successful. And how do right? you define win in this argument? What's that? How do you define win? Sorry? You said it would win mimetically, but how are you defining that? Um, I mean, our policy prescriptions are now the policy of the United States. Uh, a couple years ago, that seemed impossible. Um, and that's the start. We got to spread it to the world. Every country that maintains free markets of ideas, uh, free competition, uh, you know, free markets for compute and AI are going to prosper. And those that get locked down or bogged down with regulation are going to suffer, uh, and we need to keep spreading the message because, you know, if if you adopt this mindset, you end up much far more prosperous and far better off than if you reject it. And so, to me, I had a responsibility to spread this message to bring everyone up in this new wave of uh, prosperity. And so, you know, I think if we can turn energy into value with AI compute, uh, having more value per watt through better intelli AI algorithms, there's going to be a pressure to climb up the Kardashev scale, which is the goal of EAC, right? EAC is about climbing up the Kardashev scale, more watts per civilization, and then extropic is more intelligence per watt. And that's, that fulfills my life's mission personally, which is to expand the scope and scale of intelligence in our universe. And so, that's incredible. Yeah. That's amazing. OK, I think they're going to shoot me if I don't rap, but Maybe I'll end with just saying a genuine thank you. I feel like everyone, in, or a lot of people in this room probably do follow you. You're a huge advocate for a lot of the principles that we all believe in. So thanks for making this EAC a reality. Thank you. <laughs>